Splatoon 3 is the third game in the long-running Splatoon series, I mean, it's in the name, and the game has you play as an Inkling or an Octoling, which are creatures that are half kid, half squid, or octopus battling it out against others in the game's signature mode, Turf War, and other multiplayer modes. But there are other game modes too, like story modes which cover the tensions between Inklings and Octarians, a card game introduced in Splatoon 3, and the most mysterious of them all, Salmon Run, which was introduced in Splatoon 2. In this game mode, a group of four players go around slaying Salmonids to collect their golden eggs and deposit them in an egg basket. This needs to be done within a time limit, a certain amount of eggs need to be deposited, and there are three rounds to complete, and a team's performance nets them rewards. All of this is completed under the company Grizzco Industries, and it's been like that since Splatoon 2. Now, let me set the stage here. In Splatoon 2, not much was known about Grizzco or why we were collecting Salmonid eggs for Mr. Grizz, the one running the company, but we continued to run, and then Splatoon 3 hit. We find out that Mr. Grizz is a bear and is having us collect golden eggs to turn dominant marine life on Earth into mammals to restore balance. We defeat him and that should be that, but no. Salmon Run is still open to play. Who's running it is up for debate. It could be Lil Judd as he now has a headset on him and he uses a Salmonid deck in the Table Turf card game, but that doesn't explain why we're still collecting golden eggs. Salmon Run has also had some changes. It was taken to another level, the next wave. Everything is more intense and overwhelming, especially with the inclusion of more bosses and King Salmonids. The Salmonids are frenzying, fighting harder, and this has led to the Big Run events. Big runs are events that have four players attempt to complete a salmon run on a multiplayer stage instead of a regular salmon run stage. We've gotten two big runs so far, but at this time, the first big run hadn't happened yet, but that didn't stop the uploading of big run related content. YouTube users Germ and Okta uploaded a series of videos exploring the disturbing ideas of the big run in the form of analog horror, a subgenre of horror fiction and offshoot of the found footage film technique. Germ would create a series called the Grizzco Tapes, and Okta would release a Big Run employee handbook video. So, let's start with Germ's set of videos. The first one we have is Splatoon 3 Big Run. Something's gone wrong. The colorful and happy deep cut report's been hijacked in a loud and abrupt way, cutting to a screen that says, no signal. This text can be translated thanks to ciphers like these created through the efforts of fans found on the Splatoon wiki. Now throughout this, inkling or octoling gibberish can be heard. Could it be deep cut segments barely coming through, or something else? Maybe a mass panic. This screen then shows up and the middle text translates to, This is an emergency, please follow the instructions above. The bottom text to, please stand by, but the top text doesn't translate properly when compared to its round script cipher. Flipping the letters vertically and horizontally gives us this. It's please stand by, in reverse. But despite all of this, there are no instructions given for us to follow. After some more glitching, it's clear that this is a Grizzco related broadcast, and something catches the eye of this inkling on screen, and then we see what might have happened. The King Salmonid Kohozuna appears followed by the text Ashian Elik, Primary Entry Point System I, Primary Entry Point System, Issues An, This Is An Emergency, Please Follow The Instructions Above, Emergency Notific. So let's look at the obvious first. 
primary entry point system, this may be referring to the system hosting the emergency broadcast. We know that this is an emergency because it says so, and we're told to please follow the instructions above, again. But there's no instructions. What about this other text? Emergency notific seems to link up to the top left Ashian text, so emergency notification. What the top right and middle text says is up for debate, since Alec and Issues N doesn't really link up to anything, but what's for certain is that there's a big run emergency. Grizz Code Tape Volume 1. We have a title slide stating, Property of Ikai Major Investigation Team. This videotape is classified. Unauthorized viewing of this tape is prohibited. And the team seems to have a squid logo seen in the bottom right. What's happening may be hinted at in the team name, Ikai, the Japanese word for spirit world, underworld, and the next world. Redacted. Where is Kai? Data expunged. Where is Kai? File terminated. The Grizzco tapes. We have a missing persons case on our hands. As of now, Grizzco Industries employments and business activities are being temporarily halted after being deemed as a major suspect following the disappearance of Kai Shiryi. The disappearance of young professional Grizzco worker Kai remains an ongoing mystery as all and any record activities or documents that would lead to knowing where or when she disappeared are nowhere to be found. All that is known during the period of her disappearance was that some of her co-workers had mentioned the very next day would have been her birthday. She would have turned 15. We get her details after this. Nothing seems out of the ordinary, except for two details. Kai's date of birth and her identifying characteristics. 12, 6, 13 XX. We know that the world of Splatoon takes place in the same year as ours. A day passes here, a day passes in Splatoon. Even the world's history is similar to ours. So Kai being born in the 14th century is odd, to say the least. Secondly, her identifying characteristic is a scar on her right ear. How did she get this scar? And will it come into play later? We can also see that when she was last seen has been redacted, but we know that she disappeared the day before her birthday, so it could have been June 11th. The text on the bottom is interesting too. It translates to, This is an emergency. Please follow the instructions above. This message again. Kai had only been officially reported missing by her parents three days after not responding to her phone. Supposedly, Kai's co-workers should have been the first people to report her missing, as they would have been the last people Kai had been with. But, apparently, they have no recollection or idea of Kai even disappearing. Kai had no friends. Grizzco, Chinook Unit. A Chinook is a type of helicopter that is most likely the type that we take to and from salmon runs. When Kai was last seen leading for a shift on Redacted, she did not come back with her crew, as per standard Grizzco procedure. According to the co-workers, she took overtime to remain on the leave ship. Upon their return, when interrogating the crew, Kai should have apparently been with we were met with further confirmation, and that she had left by the time we arrived. There was no sign leave.
there is something in the water, in this murky sea, and it's linked to Kai's disappearance. We are no closer to finding Kai. Grisco has already reopened business as there is no explicit proof for their involvement in her disappearance. The Calamari County Ministry of Public Safety knows nothing of her disappearance. The Splatcast Company knows nothing of Kai's disappearance. Nobody seems to know anything. From here, an Ikai investigator calls the Grisco Company and talks to a receptionist. What we find out here is that Grisco is very secretive and their runners need to sign waivers and anonymity packs within them. And the Kai incident is being swept under the rug like it never happened. Referencing her unit, the Chinook unit, and the run, 349.12 Polaris seems to make the receptionist nervous. The text above the callers and recipients' names seems to be abbreviations of their names as well. And then, we get this. That's the end of tape 1. The investigator is cut off by an automated message, we can assume that this employee was disposed of, and that this won't be the last time we hear from Grisco. A big question we have to ask ourselves is, what caused Kai to go missing, and why? Was it something supernatural? A king salmonid? What happened to Kai's ear? The mystery regarding what happened to Kai will continue. We get our regular opening card followed by Latin. Ab aqua libertas. Freedom from water. A mysterious sentence. Now the subject matter of this tape is a salmon run training video. There's six parts we have to go through, with a seventh to wrap things up in this energetic and upbeating sounding tape. What's good to note is that the music used here is the same music used in the Nintendo Direct video announcing Salmon for Splatoon 2. Let's pause right here, at the Salmonid Territory part. Splatoon 2, Sunk and Scroll 18. This appears to be a painting from the Middle Ages. It depicts a great migration of salmon said to occur once every 70 years. So this migration event is correct. However, we have this here, golden eggs fueling modern and comfortable lives. Splatoon 1, Sunk and Scroll 1. Since time immemorial, a rare type of electric catfish known as the zapfish has been prized by Inkling society as a source of energy. In fact, the entire city of Inkopolis is powered by a single 100 year old great zapfish. That contradicts what's being said here. Something's not adding up. Could this be propaganda created by Grizzco to cover up what Grizz really wanted the golden eggs for? To turn dominant marine life into mammals? 
After all, telling Inklings and Octolings that the golden eggs collected will power up their cities and comfortable lives sounds much better than telling them that collecting them will spell their doom. It looks like we're skipping some things. The boss Salmonids, which is suspicious. You think that would be important to note, but that suspicious behavior may be further proof that Kai is missing thanks to a Salmonid boss. And all of this legal talk is extremely iffy as well. Part 4 has changed from legal attachments to responsibilities, and this is where things continue to spiral. We're given 5 responsibilities, number 22, 23, 24, 25, and 34. These responsibilities that were shown are all strict and seem to be purposeful. Despite that, some of them seem strange. Number 23, 24, and 34. Do not enter the water. Do not let teammates get stuck in water and this about litter and people found in a harvest. Litter, we can understand. Don't leave any Grizzco related items or anything on a person behind so that no connections or leads can be tracked back to Grizzco. But finding people? There's something definitely in the water. No matter how you look at it, salmon runs are a shady yet lucrative business. To harvest an intelligent species eggs to use as a source of fuel is evil, and the fact that Grisco set up shop in two areas must be connected to collusion with police, right? But despite that, employees are encouraged to talk to Grisco crew members or officials if any issues arise. And who knows, we don't have the full story on what the salmonids are. We're then given a shot of what seems to be a sea floor hinted at by the sounds of the sea, and then this image. I've looked at the lumetriscopes of both parts and have found nothing in the audio, and toning up the brightness in each shot only creates more questions as to what we're looking at. The best guess we have is, is what's in the water, what could have gotten Kai. From here, we have who we can assume to be a Grisco official interrogating an employee on what happened to Kai. Here we learn three very important things. That this employee witnessed what happened to Kai, that she did in fact fall into the water, and the Grizzco officials won't shy away from threatening their employees. This trading tape has revealed a lot about the secrecy of Grizzco. Things will be redacted, erased, and legalities are kept tight-knit, teetering the line between legal and illegal. The mystery regarding what happened to Kai will continue. At the start of Volume 3, we get an extended version of the intro we saw in Volume 1 before the regular Grizzco tape intro plays. <laughs> 
Following that, we have more Latin. He or she is rocked by the waves, but does not sink. This signifies resilience, so Kai may still be alive. Continuing on, we have information coming from an unknown detective documenting the missing person's case. The detective refers to the phone call with Grisco that occurred in Volume 1, meaning that this detective was most likely the caller. What's interesting is that the detective suggests that the Ikai Major Investigation Team suspects that Grisco is the primary involvement party in Kai's disappearance. From what we've seen, it definitely looks like they're trying to cover up the incident, but to be primarily involved? There is much to speculate. Two days and four hours later, the Ikai team member was contacted by Grisco representatives with the same threats given by the automated message from Volume 1. And then, they receive a phone call from an anonymous caller who they refer to as Tu, a former Salmon Runner who states he has information on the run Kai disappeared on. Run 349.12 Polaris. What's interesting to note in this call is that Tu was fired for not doing what he was meant to do. He suffers from anxiety and something neurological that almost slips out that he's clearly not supposed to talk about, and Tu sends a middleman to talk to give the Ikai detective information. We're then shown the interview with Tu's middleman, Warabi Chang, that takes place at the Nantai Police Station, 19.34pm. Here's what we can deduce from this call. Tu can't speak about things and he's been mopey as of late, and Grisco hands out really cheap disposable recorders for work shift logging to all employees. These are usually handed out before being taken to Salmon Waters, and they have small built-in cameras for taking photos before and after a run. The audio recorders are cheap, easy to make, they break easily, and they're mass-produced by Grisco. Falling into water messes up the device, and the recordings are taken and put onto servers for archiving. And then, we get the biggest piece of information. Employees are permitted to listen to their own recordings, and Tu has his recording of Kai going missing since he was there on that shift, which we find out was on Maruna's Bay. And it's now off limits. The middleman hands the USB stick with the recording, and that's that from the interview. No wonder Tu thought he'd get into hot water for spilling this information. One thing to note is the text in the top left of the image, P-H-O-Z-D. Seems like gibberish. The time in the bottom right doesn't match with the interview time either, so it's likely that these two pieces of text correspond with surveillance footage of the middleman rather than the interview time itself. We then get footage of someone on a desktop loading up the recording. The text that shows up during this process doesn't seem to be too important from what I can decipher, but the loading screen here may be. Attempting to decipher this stuff is tough. Letters seem to merge together and some have lines in them that make some letters hard to make out. But there's sort of a theme here. Attempting to do something and not being able to do it anymore. Or being able to do it. I can or can't do it anymore. The video loads and we get this. For the most part, things are pretty tame, but as the recording gets to the end, that's when we hear and see it. It sounds like the shift ends at round 3, and then a low-pitched horn can be heard followed by panic and splashing in water. Kai was taken in the water, and we know this now thanks to Tu's recording of the shift. I can't stop breathing. Something is in the water. I love you. I hate you. I'm feeling every part of. This is most likely referring to Kai, and it sounds like she's really struggling with whatever took her from the water. The I love you, I hate you part is pretty ambiguous, and so is the I'm feeling every part of. 
who's being loved, hated, and feeling every part of what? A love and hate for Grizz and Grizzco, the Salmonids, the Salmon Run, feeling every part of the water, or pain? Even a fake sky would suffice. This is written at the end of the video, beyond the end of tape 3. It sounds like Kai might be missing the sky. Where would Kai have been taken for her to think this? The ocean? A cave? A building? This statement also echoes the fake sky of Alterna, coincidentally where Grizz had his rocket. It's a statement of desperation and yearning for something familiar, implying that Kai wouldn't even be able to see the sky. And that's where things end. So, where does this story leave us? The big run was seen as an emergency, an event that compromised the safety of people. Whether or not this is linked to the Grizzco tapes is up for debate, but it follows the disturbing and eerie themes that the Salmon Run encompasses. The glitching visuals of the video, the blaring sounds and aesthetics of everything is all really well done and invokes a feeling of dread, just as many emergency alerts would. The text found in the video is still a bit cryptic since some things can't be deciphered very well and no instructions are given, but hey, that seems to be part of the mystery. There is fear in the unknown. But maybe you can decipher it. The Grizzco tapes utilize similar audio and visual designs too. It all feels like you're actually watching old tapes of events that took place. That feeling of dread is present again due to Grisco Industries being depicted as a dark and ruthless organization hell-bent on keeping its secrets and not getting involved with police. There are also grammatical errors seen throughout the videos, but I don't think they take away from the content itself. And as we've seen, there's a story here too about the missing inkling, Kai Shiri. From what we've been able to piece together, there's something in the water, and Kai went missing during an overtime shift and it's being covered up by Grisco with suspicions that the company is primarily involved. We also learn that there's a lot of strictness and legal issues that Grisco Industries implements for their own company's sake. We see that when the Ikai investigator is called up by Two, and Two sends in a middleman to speak for them to not breach any signed documentation. The middleman reveals that he has a copy of the recording from Kai's last shift, and it's unsettling to say the least because we hear a horn blare before Kai gets taken after she falls into the water. The story here gives us enough to work with and to understand, but leaves us with so many questions. Like what's in the water? A king salmonid? Is the big run announcement video part of all of this? What does disposing of an employee mean? Why should employees avoid the police? And where is Kai? Germ's done a great job creating all of this, so if you want to check it all out for yourself, look into it and create your own conclusions to things, their channel and videos will be linked in the description. And now we'll move on to Okta's videos, starting off with the Big Run Emergency Broadcast. This video isn't a form of analog horror, but I thought I'd showcase it quickly anyway because it gives us a glimpse into what a panicked and broadcasted Big Run announcement would look like. It starts off as a regular Splatcast broadcast but with some glitches, and then it devolves into chaos. It looks pretty legit, like this could actually be an event that's scripted into the game. All of the emergency text and instructions being shown instills a sort of fear yet excitement. You load up your game and see this? I'm sure you'd be ready to defend yourself and Splatsville despite the announcement being off-putting since it would be a bit off-brand for Nintendo. And that brings us to the Big Run Employee Handbook video. It starts off fairly normal, like any instructional tape without a voiceover would, but it doesn't take long for it to derail.
It's clear to see that this Octoling here went missing during the big run, and taking a look back at the how to protect yourself and your loved ones section reveals how. A phone call then plays between the missing Octoling and a member of the SPD. I think that refers to the Splatoon Police Department. The missing Octoling put up a fight, but was inevitably taken by a Salmonid, and no one came to her rescue. And this is why. The Clan Protocol. It really taps into the fear and dread of a government body made to uphold safety, not upholding it. Where one person says something and doesn't mean it. So you're left with a preconception that things will be fine when they really won't be. It's all to keep face and to guarantee no public panic from victims in stressful situations. Stay safe. Hide. Fight. Do whatever it takes to survive the big run. Absolute Anarchy. So, what we've been able to see is that Octus created a video warning us of the big run and the dangers associated with it, and then a video explaining what a big run is, what to do if you're in danger, what to do and what not to do if you're working in the SPD. From what we can gather, if you're caught out during a big run, good luck. People are encouraged not to help you out of fear for their safety, but you're encouraged to defend yourself with weapons, even if it doesn't end well. These were a much shorter pair of videos compared to Germs, but I think Okta got out all that is needed to be shown and said. And sure, there were some little hiccups in the videos, especially this one that broke the fourth wall and made me question my computer's capabilities, but I don't think it really takes away from the videos. So well done to Okta, their channel and videos will be linked in the description. From here, we can ask ourselves if we're going to be seeing more videos from these two. Regarding Germ's videos, either could happen. We have our answer as to what happened to Kai. The footage isn't too clear, but we know she was taken, and we know a whole lot about how Grisco Industries operates, but we don't know what's in the water. What kind of salmonid took her? It could have been a king salmonid, or something we don't know about. Maybe it'll stay a mystery because, like I said, there is fear in the unknown. Regarding Octa's videos, it seems like this could be it, but who knows. That's the beauty of an idea like the big run. Not much is known about it or why the salmon is frenzy every 70 years, and these two concepts seem pretty likely to be related. There is so much to speculate and a lot of disturbing interpretations can be made out about all of this. And this can be said about Splatoon in general. There's still so much we don't know and so much that can be told. What was Grizz's 12,000 years like? How was the human experience once society crumbled? What's happening with Grizzco now? Is Lil Judd truly up to something? What are King Salmonids? What lies in the Splatlands? Who are the staff? Who are the Splatcast clans? What's become of the Deep Sea Metro? And much, much more. If you want to dive into all of this, like I've already said, I'll have Germs and Octo's channels and videos linked in the description for you to check out. It's good to note as well that they do make content outside of analog horror, and if you crave more Splatoon analog horror, searching for this term on YouTube brings up loads of other videos for you to binge and get into as well. So if you enjoyed the video, a like and subscribe would be much appreciated. I'm really close to 50,000 subs now, so it would be awesome to get there. And if you want to see more deep dives into Splatoon analog horror, analog horror in general, or some creepy styled videos, please leave a comment telling me that. Make a suggestion if you want as well, why not? But as always, here's a massive shout out to my lovely patrons, you guys are legends, and I'll catch ya in the next one.